So we're going to celebrate now. Here we go. Y'all are nice and warmed up. Here we go. We're going to sing another familiar song. Everybody ready for Christmas? Yes. yes. Oh, I love that good, solid, strong answer. Yes.
strange prologue But what the glad some tidings be we know Which inspire your heavenly song hand, hug somebody's neck, just wish them a Merry Christmas. Go ahead and do that for a few moments. As you're finding your seats, I know you've been able to uh, interact with one another, and please do so after the service. <laughs> but I want to grab your attention again just to highlight a few things, and I want to show you a video from the International Mission Board. Uh, Merry Christmas to every one of you. Glad that you are here today. Uh, this is our uh, Christmas Eve service and candlelight service. Uh, we will not be gathering this evening, but I trust that uh, you with your family and your friends will enjoy a time of celebration and loving one another. Because it's really not about the gifts under the tree. It's about the presence of the people with you and the presence of God in our midst, that God has come to be in our world and in our lives. Uh, thankful for that. Uh, Christmas gift uh, to the church. We have secured the purchase of that bus that's sitting in the parking lot. So in 2018, uh, we will be using that for ministry purposes as soon as we can get that tagged. Uh, it is uh, not requiring a CDL license, so anybody who has a, a typical driver's license uh, uh, it would qualify to drive it, but what we're going to be looking for, and Dwight's going to coordinate this for us, is let's get a, a few volunteer drivers that qualify under our insurance. If, if perhaps once a month or once every other month, you might donate a Sunday morning uh, to go with Miguel and pick up some of the folks that are needing help to get here on a Sunday morning. Would you love to do that and see more people worshiping because the, uh, the, the transportation is no longer a barrier to them. So uh, you'd be praying about how in 2018 you can participate uh, in that, uh, and then uh, we'll have some great, uh, great opportunities. Uh, 
I don't really have anything else to say other than I'm, I'm thankful that you're here. If you're a guest with us at Crossroads, uh, I'm glad that you're here and being a part of uh, what's going on here. I trust that you will uh, uh, find some times to come back and join us. And uh, next week, we're going to begin 21 days of prayer uh, for 2018, praying for our church, praying for our nation, and praying for those who don't know Christ that we're going to be reaching out to in, uh, in this uh, upcoming year. A few weeks ago, we had our World Impact Conference and uh, focusing on what ministries we want to uh, partner with financially, prayerfully, and also going if we are able to. And the International Mission Board is one of those. And so let me pray for our offering. And while we're receiving our offering, I want you to watch the video of how your monies are being used to reach people all over the world. Father, thank you for the grace that you give us. And I'm thankful for Christmas in that it is a reminder to us that, that God incarnate came to save his people from their sins. And Father, as we are receiving that truth and, and being transformed by uh, that, uh, that Christ child and the Savior that he is, Father, I pray that we would also be ambassadors and, and, and those who would carry the message to others. Let us be prayerful of how we are going to uh, share that message. Let us be sacrificial in our, in our giving so that missionaries can go. And Father, let us look for opportunities where we can be that missionary. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a team and as a community of believers, God has given us a mission. God compels us together to reach a massive city. What? Mexico City is a free for all. A lot of traffic. Traffic, terrible traffic. There are things that can happen. They're not the worst things in the world. Everybody's in a hurry. Getting anywhere takes forever. Millions and millions of people coming in from Europe, South America. Cultural influences from all over the world that you find here in business and art and music. From Germany, from the Middle East, from Africa, from China. From unreached people groups around the world. They're not an isolated country full of mariachis. <laughs> Where are the unreached places? Who are the unreached people? It's hard to know kind of where to begin. There's so many pockets of different areas, of different groups. Jewish, Mexicans, Germans. A Lebanese community. So the city has a reach worldwide, and we want to follow those lines to take the gospel all over the world. The Lord has put together a team of incredible people. Who are humble and are submissive to one another. When I look at our team, we are a small representation of what Mexico is. Cuban-American, a girl from Memphis. Koreans. I was born in Cuba. Lily was born in Colombia. Todd Beal, I think he's like a descendant of a Cherokee chief or something like that. Different experiences, different backgrounds. The dynamic of working together as a team is there's so much that we can offer together. Trabajar unidos con diferentes dones con un mismo propósito Jesucristo. Mega City presents a lot of challenges. Their fellowship time is, is not with their next door neighbor. Their fellowship are the connections they have through their works. How do you minister in a world like that? Most ministry happens at night because that's when people are home. So you have to be willing to be at someone's house till midnight, whatever it takes. That burden of lostness, I think it weighs heavy on all of us on the team. Because we're only a team of 12 people and there's 28 million people, we can't reach them by ourselves. We're seeking to leverage, to mobilize, to, to be catalytic in the way that we're working. Invitan para conferencias el internet, el Skype. Tengo grupos de Cali, Colombia. Tengo grupos de Italia. Tengo grupos en todo lugar. Mentoring with guys who are studying here at this campus, especially the guys who are interested in pastoring or missions or sensing some kind of a calling. We're trying to team together with our national partners here. Working with the seminaries. The local churches, as well as folks coming down from our Baptist churches in the States. Limitless partners from the United States. To be able to get the gospel in their homes and in their hearts. We cannot do it alone. God's still calling people. He hasn't stopped not just to be pastors, not just to be teachers, not just to be local missionaries, but to reach all the nations. the Savior. He came, he came to save us from sin and give us eternal life. 
but he also came to save us from this world and give us abundant life here. He came to set captives free. If there's anything that's keeping you from being free today, give it over to God this morning as we sing praises to his son. singing in the morning but we're celebrating for tonight and for tomorrow morning tonight's a holy night just think about it, how God chose to send the savior of the world what a crazy idea but lucky for us right
Praise you, Lord God. Thank you for tonight. Thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. One evening, in a house in a quiet neighborhood, a little boy was getting ready for bed. And as his mother was tucking him in, Charlie looked up at her and said, Mommy, please don't forget to turn on the nightlight before you leave my room. Mrs. Cobb smiled at him and said, Don't worry, sweetheart, I'll be sure to turn on the light. I won't leave you in the dark. The next day, Grandpa came for dinner. Charlie went and sat on his knee and said, Grandpa, why is it that I'm afraid of the dark? And why do so many people I know seem to be afraid of the dark too? Grandpa looked at Charlie and said, Not only are lots of people afraid of the dark, many people are afraid of the light. Afraid of the light, said Charlie. Why would that be? Grandpa said, To understand that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to start at the beginning. In fact, at the very beginning. Once upon a time, there was a great king who was the king of light. This great king of light made a group of people and he made them so that they could shine brightly just as he did. He called them his little lightlings. He set the lightlings in a beautiful garden that he prepared for them, a garden that was full of bright sunshine. And the lightlings loved it when the king came to visit them at the end of the day. But then one day something terrible happened. 
the lightlings decided to do what they wanted to do instead of what their king had commanded them to do. And the very second that they sinned, their light became dim, and they were filled with shame and with great embarrassment. And so they ran as fast as they could to get away from the king. From then on, they were afraid of the light because they knew that wherever the light was, the king would be. And the king would see them in their shame. Now, after the lightlings left the garden, the king began to remove his light from that garden. And the lightlings moved further and further into the woods until they lived in a place that was almost completely covered in darkness. Often they would trip and fall, scuffing their knees and bruising themselves. It was awful living in the dreadful darkness all the time. In fact, they couldn't tell the difference anymore between night and day. Then one night, or perhaps it was even day, far off in the distance, they saw a blinding light shining through the trees. They thought that the light meant that the king was coming to find them, to punish them for their sins. So most of the lightlings began to stumble quickly away from the light. But some of the lightling children were so amazed and interested in the light that they decided to see from where it was coming. So they set off and traveled for many miles. But as they moved, they saw the light shining brighter and brighter. And finally, they came to a clearing in the forest. And in the middle of the clearing, they saw a father lightling, a mother lightling, and a little baby who was shining like the sun. The father lightling said, he is not my son. He is the son of the king of light. The king has given him to us as a special gift, and there will be no darkness strong enough to hide his light, no darkness deep enough to send his light away. When they heard this, the lightning children knelt down at the baby's feet, and they began to worship him in fear and reverence. When they stood up again, their own faces were shining. It was a reflection of the light that was coming out of the baby. They rushed back to their homes, to their friends and their families as fast as their feet could carry them. The other lightlings were frightened at the sight of them. They said, what happened to you? We saw a baby who was shining with light. He is the son of the king of light. He's given us his own son to be the light of the world. The lightlings noticed that already there was more light in the forest. Now they could begin to see where they were going. They could run and play without bumping into trees or rocks and getting bruised. Yet some still hid from the light, while others realized they didn't need to be afraid anymore. They saw that living in the light was much better than the darkness they were used to. Grandpa looked at Charlie and said, you see, Charlie, we're afraid of the dark because we were made to live in the light. And someday, all of us who love this son will live with him forever in heaven. There will be no moon, there won't be any stars or even a sun. There'll be no night lights, no lamps, no lanterns, not even candles. Charlie said, well, how can that be? His grandfather replied, in the place where the king's son now lives, the light that shines forever still comes from inside of him. And all who come into his presence will never be in darkness again. Every time that you see the sun or the moon, the stars, or every time you light a candle or turn on your little night light, Remember the story of the child that the King of Light brought into the darkness of this world. And remember that he gave us this baby as a present. 
Charlie, as long as you remember that, you will never, ever, ever have to be afraid of the dark again. R.C. Sproul wrote that children's book several years ago, and then they put that to a little video. R.C. Sproul uh, passed away just last week, and, uh, and now he is living in the presence of the light. But I couldn't uh, think of a better way to capture the Christmas story than presenting that for all the ages that are sitting in this room today. We've been in this uh, series of uh, Christmas Unwrapped. I wanted to conclude that today. Is everyone ready for Christmas? Absolutely. Kids are always yes. Uh, some of the adults are yes. Some of the adults are, well, not quite. I've got some meals to prepare. I've got some presents still to wrap. Uh, a few guys out there might be saying, I still need to go buy something. Uh, quick trip is open. So uh, tomorrow is an interesting day in our world. The world shuts down, pretty much. That there's not a lot of activity out on the streets. We focus on one single event. Offices will be closed. The hustle that has taken place over the last several uh, weeks will come to a close. Why is Christmas such a big deal? What difference does it really make? How can a baby born 2,000 years ago eliminate traffic on 285 for an entire day. That's pretty amazing. It's because this is no ordinary baby. The Bible says that God came to earth and wrapped flesh around himself and his name was Jesus. Jesus. It's bigger news than when man landed on the moon or NASA now saying that they're trying to send somebody to Mars. That God came to earth is a big deal. God invaded our world, splitting history into B.C. and A.D. I mean, every time you send an email, any time you, you write a check, every time you submit an assignment, Jesus is present because of the date that determines 2017. That baby split history. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, in John 3.16, that he gave his only son. It's amazing that when Jesus entered the world, he entered just like everyone else as a baby. Of all the ways Jesus could have entered the world, why did he choose to come the same way you and I uh, entered the world? Not with all the bells and whistles that he could have, but humbly as a baby in a lonely manger. Why? Perhaps so that he would be more approachable. Drawing people into his presence. People are always drawn to babies. No one's really scared of a baby. Might be scared of holding a baby at times, but you're not really scared of a baby. This king of light entered our world, our dark world. This approachable king we need not be afraid of. If he would have stayed in the manger, we wouldn't be here today. But he grew up and he taught us about God the Father and, and, and showed himself to be God himself. Well, so what? Even if he is God, what difference does it make? It makes all the difference. He went from that crib all the way to the cross. He died on that cross to be our Savior. It's what he was told of him when, when he was first introduced to us in, in, uh, in that manger. In Luke chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, 
who is the Messiah, the Lord. This baby came to save us. I want to be as simple and as straightforward as possible this morning. The Bible says that because Jesus came as a gift for us, we can receive great blessings from this gift. And today I want to highlight just three of these blessings that affect our past, affect our present, and affect our future. We've talked about the pre-incarnate Christ a few weeks ago and the prophecies about Christ. Today I want us to focus on this present of Christ, the greatest gift ever given to us. So let me highlight just these three and point out a few verses throughout the Bible that will help us to understand it more fully. The present of Christ, that, that gift that has been given to us, gives us, number one, an endless forgiveness. An endless forgiveness. Three siblings went to the store with their mom to see Santa. The oldest, an eight-year-old boy, says, Mom, I've got this. Let me represent the family, and I'll go talk first. So he goes, he, he gets in front of Santa. He says, I'm too big to sit on your lap, but I'll just stand here and tell you a few things. My siblings are over there with my mom. You can see them. I've got a brother who's six. Do you see him? He's a pretty good boy. Give him a break this year. The four-year-old little girl there, she's my sister. She's a mess. She messes up my room. She breaks my toys. She's not worth very much. So let's teach her a lesson this year and just bypass her totally. He says, but I'm Billy, and I'm good all the time. Here's the problem with Billy and so many people in our world. No one is good all the time. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans tells us this, that we are in a position that we need forgiveness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but there's good news and are justified by His grace as a gift. This gift, how does it come? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This baby, knowing that we are sinners separated from God, need to be given grace and be justified, cleansed, and that can only happen through Christ himself. The bad news and the good news listed in these verses. Yes, it tells us no one is perfect, that all need redemption. I don't even measure up to my own standards. How in the world could I ever measure up to God's? We all have regrets. We're all guilty of some things. And here's the, the problem with guilt. Guilt devastates our lives. It robs us of happiness. It causes depression in some. It makes us sick. Guilt wreaks havoc on us because we don't know how to get rid of it. You can't undo the past. People will do anything to try to relieve themselves of guilt. They'll try drugs or alcohol. They'll go to counseling or maybe they'll just go to Disney World and think that all the guilt will go away because it's the happiest place on earth. Then they return home and the guilt remains. People will do anything to cover up the mistakes that they wish they hadn't done. But listen, there's only one solution for the guilt and sin of our past. That is full forgiveness in Christ alone, who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He offers good news. The good news about this forgiveness is that God's forgiveness is instant. He doesn't make you wait to forgive you. You don't apply and have to go through a thorough review and a lot of background checks and then get denied. God's forgiveness is instant at the desire that you have and you ask for it. God's forgiveness is undeserved. You'll never earn it. You'll ne you can't work for it. You can't buy it. You can't bribe God for it. It's simply undeserved. 
and it is complete. If you look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the book of Psalms, it says in 103, verse 11 and following, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. Verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions, our sins from us. And that's not in the circular pattern of the world. It is as far as the east is from the west, one straight line. And it just is thrown as far away from us as possible. This is a blessing from the gift of Christ. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, I am he who blots out your transgressions, your sins, for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Is that good news today? Perhaps we should take the perspective of God. If he chooses not to remember them, then maybe we should do the same. If you were to pray out to God and say, God, I need your forgiveness. My past is blotted with all kinds of of embarrassing and and, and detrimental things. I have have done things wrong to other people. I have had the wrong thoughts. And and I I just, I don't know what to do, but would you forgive me? He will completely cleanse you from all of it. If you were to ask him five minutes later, but do you remember that one time? He would say, no, and you shouldn't either. This baby didn't come to condemn. He came to save. And he will remember them no longer. Satan may want to bring up what he remembers and throw that in your face. But rather than believe the lies of the evil one, you should just quote him the Bible. My transgressions have been thrown as far as the east is from the west, and I, like God, remember them no more. I am living in the light. I am one of his children. Don't bother me. I will worship him, and you will flee. Have you ever been halfway through a painting, a room, or and just he looked at it he says I wish I could just start over you ever been halfway through writing a paper and you're just like no this just isn't working I wish I could just start over you ever been halfway through your life and just go man I wish I wish I knew then what I know now and I wish I could just start over well we can't go backwards but this is what God promises us from the gift of Christ the blessing of forgiveness is that he does allow us in a sense, to get a brand new start. He says, at the point that you are fully forgiven, that you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, He cleanses you, and He gives you a brand new future, a new hope. Jesus told Nicodemus, He calls it, born again that you get something brand new. Paul writes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, read that out loud with me, he is a new creation. Brand new. It doesn't matter if you're 75 years old or you're 17. You're brand new at the point that you receive Christ and he fully cleanses you and makes you his child you're brand new you have a new hope a new future a new life a new perspective a new purpose God's forgiveness is not about turning over a new leaf it's about God giving you a brand new life it's like starting all over again no matter who you are or what you've done, no matter, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, no matter um, what, uh, where you've been, to God, his forgiveness is available. 
But that's not all. The second observation I see in Scripture is this. Not only does he give you uh, uh, this uh, unending forgiveness, he gives you enabling grace. The presence of Christ gives enabling grace. We understand grace is, is that which we receive that we don't deserve. And at the point of salvation, we don't deserve salvation, but out of his benevolence and, and overwhelming love, he rescues us. But you realize grace is not just for salvation from our past. Grace is offered to us in our present so that we can live the life, the abundant life. Thomas mentioned just a moment ago, we need the abundant life now. And so when you're reading in Scripture, there are t- sometimes it speaks of the grace from our past, but there are t- other times it speaks of the enabling grace for your present. I need his strength today. I need his perspective now. I, I, I can't overcome these difficulties without God's helping me to move through it. He won't sometimes let me go around it. He, he won't let me avoid it. He says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. That's now, present. The enabling grace that he gives us is from the gift of Christ. Over the holiday season, I've seen a lot of tired and stressed out people. Some of them are in this room. Not sure the cause for everyone, but I, I know that life can wear you down. There was an article just recently in the, in the newspaper was saying that 87% of people were saying they are over the limit of their stress uh, in our country right now. I mean, there's responsibilities, there's relationships, there's a lack of rest. It all adds up over time. And looking around, it seems people are searching for additional power for everything. Some people buy energy drinks just to give them the boost they need. Some people use power pills just to, to make it through. Some people are reading a new book on how to have power in, in every situation. People are always looking for a boost or to help them to do more, to be more. Well, when we are in Christ, he gives us all that we need. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 Paul speaking of joy throughout the entire book. He talks about the various circumstances he has found himself in with much and with little, and he begins to tell us, I can do all things, what? Read this part, through him who strengthens me. He's not talking about the past, he's talking about right now. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, God's enabling grace gives you the strength to move forward. You're gonna make it. Some of you I know are kind of sliding in to 2018, thanking God that it's almost over. Listen, you're going to make it. Don't depend upon your strength. Depend upon Him who will strengthen you. God's grace is not merely a means of escape. It's, a, it's an enabling to live our life abundantly by Him and for Him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, he says in this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. We get that. He also says, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Does anybody need anything from God today? Don't be shy. God did not come to be served but to serve those who are in need. God can't be served by human hands, as if he needs anything. But he sees a people that he knows he must rescue and save them. He sees a people bumbling along in life, struggling, afraid to ask for the very help that they need. Don't be arrogant, saying, God's too busy for me. God loves you, and he has offered all that you need. Ask him. If you know God, you would ask far more than you do. 
Ask him. He wants to give you the enabling grace to sustain and actually not just keep you at the, the bottom level. He wants to provide far more for you, that you would have an abundant life, that you would be far more effective to give him glory and to, to be attractive to other people. They say, there's something about them. They've got joy that's unspeakable. They've got a way of, for, uh, of seeing life that just seems so out, out of this world. Yes, when we live in God's presence and we understand his grace that sustains sustains me every morning. His mercies are new every morning, and his grace is always available. When we live with that perspective and that motivation, and the Holy Spirit's living within us and motivates us to move forward, it is out of this world. I'm tired of what the world can provide. I want to trust and on what God can provide, because it's far better. This baby is the one who brought this, the one the God who took on flesh and, and was born on that first Christmas morn. He's the one who came to, from the crib to the cross so that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? One example of things that we need is is found in John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, he says to his disciples. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Just a, a few thoughts. We have a lot of times in this world where we, we talk about peace. There's peace treaties that have been signed and peace between uh, couples and peace between businesses and peace you know, in, in churches. And there are a lot of peace that people try to, 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 to orchestrate. And peace typically is lack of conflict. Once again, the world's peace will always be lacking. How many times in your generation has there been a peace treaty in the Middle East? How's that been working? But Jesus says, listen, peace I live with you. My peace I give to you. That's real peace. A peace with God and a peace of God in our lives to live and walk across waters that seem choppy, but as long as our focus is on Christ, we are at peace. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It's one of the gifts, the enabling graces God gives us when we trust in the Christ child that has been granted to us. Finally, this present of Christ gives eternal life. One of the simplest verses to understand this is in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but there's a free gift, and it's from God, and that gift is eternal life. Unending forgiveness, enabling grace, and eternal life, and that eternal life is in Christ Jesus when he is our Lord, we surrender to him. We seek his forgiveness and we want to uh, put off the old man and put on the new that he provides. The fear of death no longer will have a hold on us. You know, the fear of death is a universal problem. Even among the, the harshest murderers of this world, they are afraid to die doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, educated or uneducated, what country you came from or what color of your skin. We're all going to face death. It's a universal problem. Studies show that life is still 100% fatal. So it's not, oh, are we going to die? It's, are we prepared to die? Since we're all going to die, it's pretty foolish to be unprepared for something that you know is inevitable. We can run from God our entire lives, but when we die, there's no more running. We'll meet him face to face, and, and we'll, have, uh, we'll stand in a position either under the, the covering of Christ or we'll stand on our own. Well, how can you make certain what's going to happen to you on the other side? 
Well, if you already have an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not worried about dying. You may not like the pain that gets you to your death, but death has no more sting. For a Christian, death is just a homecoming, a transition to somewhere much better. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, I write these things, all these things that we've really heard, but, but in John he's writing about this particular book. I write these things to you who believe, and there's an indicator, in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. What's going to happen on the other side of our death? It all boils down to what you believe in this life. Do you trust that light that came for the lightlings? Do you trust the baby who said he was coming to save his people from their sins? Do you trust the God who says, I will give you all the enabling grace that you need? I am giving you my son, and I'm writing all these things to you. It's not veiled, it's not covered, it's not hidden, it's not secret. It has been exposed to you that you would know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you do? When you receive the present of Christ, you get a lot of blessings. The endless forgiveness, the enabling grace, the eternal life. And these blessings are extremely personal. God himself delivered it in person. It's extremely practical. These are exactly what you need. It covers your past. It covers your present. And it provides for you a future. These blessings are extremely priceless. The cost was that Jesus stepped out of heaven and came to earth, took on flesh, felt all the pains and agonies that we do, and he died on a cross and rose from that grave. God gave his son, when we receive a gift that expensive, you realize that somebody must really love you. These blessings are permanent. Over the years, I've received some gifts that didn't even last until New Year's. But God gave us Christ, who is a permanent gift, an eternal gift for us. So I'll conclude our time with two questions. Number one, have you received God's Christmas present of Jesus? In the news, there was a story of a guy who received a Christmas present 49 years ago and he still hadn't opened it. I thought, well, how foolish. I can't imagine someone giving me a gift and having never opened it. Someone asked you in a few weeks, how'd you like the gift I gave you? If you said, oh, I just hadn't had time to look at it yet, I haven't opened it, I I'm sure you you'd be in a little awkward situation there. Listen to me, God has given us a gift. I wonder how many of you have opened it, received it. Year after year, though, the tragedy is that a lot of people will pause for Christmas and never open the greatest gift ever given. They'll, they'll celebrate with their family around a table. They'll call it Christmas. They'll be glad they have the, the, the week off from work, and they think that's the greatest gift. They may open up some trinket or, or, or package that, that will satisfy them for a short time until the next garage sale when they get rid of it. That they have these things that are temporary that give, that give them a, a temporary satisfaction. But listen to me, how many people are going to pause tomorrow and never open the greatest gift that's ever been given in Christ? Have you accepted God's gift of forgiveness? If not, you aren't really celebrating Christmas, Christmas. You just have a holiday. Second question I have, if you have received this gift, have you shared this Christmas present with others? The best part of Christmas is giving and seeing the eyes light up and the smiles grow wide. We may be giving many presents. We may be giving many presents, this season that will, will bring happiness for a, a, a time, but why not be more open to giving someone something that will change their entire future? 
Why not take the risk to share something that will forever impact them? As believers who trust in Christ, don't withhold the greatest gift and the knowledge that you have of Him. Be open. Be loving. But share Christ and His his love, what He has done for us. It's something we ought to boast about. Boasting in Him. Let's pray together. As we close, I just pray in your own heart if if this is you God I don't understand everything about you but I believe that you love me sometimes I may have a hard time believing that but I do believe that you love me thank you for sending Jesus at Christmas this Christmas I want to receive Christ into my life your Christmas gift to me I know that Jesus lived, and he died, and he rose again for me. I ask that you come into my life. Please forgive me of my past. Help me to live for you in this present time, and give me the assurance that I'll be with you in the future when I die. Thank you for everything. And perhaps this is the prayer that you would be praying as a believer. Father, I'm thankful that you gave me that gift and you opened my eyes and heart to receive the gift of Christ as we celebrate it may you get the honor and glory but father let me not withhold that great news about your son let me share it with everyone with family that I'll interact with this week with with friends that I may see give me the boldness and the enabling grace to share with those who have not received you. Let me be clear in my words and loving in my presentation, but let me share. Your spirit prompt me to give the gift that will change their life. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite times of the Christmas service is the candle lighting because it reminds me of what we saw on the video of the lightlings I'm going to ask the elders to come forward to assist I trust that you received a a candle when you came in this morning we're going to dim the lights it's representative of the dark world that we live in but Christ the one light came in to give us hope in a future Not only did Christ come, he shared this light and he asked that we share it with others. Until the whole world is lit with his glory. You may go. candle up a little bit so the wick is above the plastic rim. and sing with the band.
something we're holding the external to remind us of the light but the light truly is within the light of Christ has come and that light is radiating out of God himself and then he plants himself in us as the Holy Spirit resides and that light illuminates from our lives that we'll blow the candles out in just a moment remember when you're walking out here you are the light of God let that light be seen now to conclude you may blow out your candles. You'll return them when you exit today. But I want us to walk out with joy, singing joy to the world. So we'll light, uh, we'll put up the lights, we'll blow out our candles, and we'll conclude our service with joy. Lift our voices in great joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Joy. 